Hey, welcome everybody to the first day of February 2023 to the Livermore. If you don't know where you are, you're at the Livermore Rotary Club meeting. Anybody confused? Nope. <laughs> All right. For those, for those of you that are uninitiated, we are going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. And I'm going to ask uh, Ellen Bell, which I know you're in the back somewhere. Who's in the back there? Would you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to the United States, United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much for doing that. Okay, special song today. <laughs> So this one's going to be short and sweet since our subject today is possibilities. Short and saucy. Short and saucy. Okay. Okay. We're going to do on top of spaghetti. Okay. Here we go. On top of spaghetti. I lost my table. And under a book, and under my pony, there's nothing but you know, and someone gets uh credit, uh, writing credit for that one, don't they? Yeah, Pete Seeger. Well, yeah, I was gonna say, okay, somebody else changed it. All right, sometimes we get very lucky today, and it is one of those days. We're going to have two thoughts. Yes, we're gonna have two. So we're gonna start with Trish Monroe and followed by Paul Thompson. Thank you, Trish. This is what happens when you get multiple means for communicating, you get double. So uh, today's February 1st, um, which is the beginning of Black History Month, um, which actually has been a thing since 1967. So we're, we're coming up on what, almost uh, 60 years now? Something like that, yeah, 60, 70, I don't know, I can't count. Um, anyway, um, and with that, I, I thought it was worth reflecting on one of the uh, American treasures, uh, which is at the National Mall, um, the uh, I can't I had written this down and left the paper at home, uh, the, the formal name of it, but it's something like the National Museum of African American History and Culture, and I think I see Mr. Roberts looking it up right now. Maybe not. Um, <laughs> um, I had the I had the privilege of visiting there uh, shortly after it opened in 2016, and. Um, I wanted to just say a word about rec recommending that to anybody who happens to be in Washington, D.C., um, but the, its layout is a model for how to think about history in that it talks about a the, the experience of a particular group of, of Americans uh, inter interwoven with um, this is a group of Americans that was brought here in slavery with all that that implies. And this museum takes it, takes that experience from the beginning, shows the good and the bad, shows the costs 
actually costs it out, and then walks through the history over time of where we stand as, uh, as a people, as a combined people, diverse people. Um, it's really worth going. If you're in Washington, it's very much worth, worth the trip. Um, and as we go through this month of February in thinking about inclusion and how we include all of us in the different ways. So that's what I have to say. Thank you very much, Trish. And then Paul, thank you very much. And, and he wrote his down. Wait, wait, how many pages is it? One page. Oh, great. Can you hear me? That's good. Okay, I'm gonna talk about human spirit. What exactly is it? So when I volunteered uh, to do this thought, I just read a few articles in the New York Times on Sunday. One was about two Russians, Maxim and Sergei, living in Siberia who escaped from being conscripted into the army to fight Ukraine. They took a small 13 foot fishing boat and weathered rough seas and aimed for a small island in the middle of the Bering Sea. They were greeted warmly by the local indigenous people who took them in and arranged to take them to US immigration. This story and others got me thinking, what does it mean to say actions like these were driven by the spirit? Also, what about the spirit and bravery of men fighting on D-Day? What about the English spirit during the Blitz on London in the Second World War? What about Schindler's, Schindler saving countless Jews from the Nazis? What about the coming together of so many nations after the tragedy of September the 11th, 2001? And what about the poor migrant worker who owns only two pairs of trousers, one for working in the fields in the Central Valley and one for church on Sundays? And what about Vaclav Havel, who was asked to and became the first president of, the Czechoslovakia, of Czechoslovakia after the collapse of the Soviet Union? A reluctant one, a poet and, and playwright wrote about the importance of culture and moral values being the motivation, should be the motivation of politicians in his book uh, called Summer Meditations. So many. What about Abraham Lincoln and his fight to end slavery? He had many opportunities to end the war, but he held out to get the Emancipation Proclamation passed. To end, does anyone know Samuel West, the actor? No one knows. <laughs> Okay, he plays Siegfried Svanen on All Creatures Great and Small on uh, PBS. Well, he is more than an actor. He lived and lives life. He is an avid stamp collector and a bird watcher. His favorite Scotch whiskey is Lagavulin 16. Happens to be my favorite Scotch whiskey too. Was his spirit different from the others? He was not of the brave sort necessarily, but arguably a, a motivating one. So look around you folks, look at the people in this room, your fellow Rotarians, look at them now, please look at them. Just to take a look around. We are all part of Rotary International and are filled with this spirit and driven to help people worldwide. Well, we had two wonderful thoughts. Thank you guys very much, Trish. Paul, thank you so much. All right. Um, uh, hey, our wonderful front line. So I know no one filled in as a reader, but let's try to do better next week. But our spur reporter is uh, Tim Barry. Tim, you're online, I assume. I hope. Because I don't see you in the room. Well... Our spur publisher is Ted Michaels. Ted is here in the room. Sub meeting photographer is Irv. Thank you very much, Irv. AV this week is Dennis O'Brien. Thank you very so much. And our Zoom host and chat monitor is Pat Coyle. Thanks very much, Pat. No Tim online. Thank you, Pat. Well, oh well. Any volunteers? Okay, I'm going to close my eyes. Somebody's hopefully going to read. No, I won't do that. All right. Do we have, first let's go online. Do we have any visiting Rotarians, Pat Coyle, online? 
I don't see any visiting Rotarians online. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Pat. How about in the room? Do we have any visiting Rotarians? With visitors, right, Ron? You, you want visitors? Okay, we'll do that next. How about any visitors online? No visitors online. Splint. All right. So, Ron, you're up. Any visitors? Any guests? I should say. Any guests? Uh, Jane is my uh, my personal care, caregiver, uh, and she she's here as a guest. Uh, Jane, welcome. welcome, Jane. Do we have any other guests? Well, President, um, I was just wondering if we should introduce them all together because you're all here. Well, I think for a you, project. Yeah, we're all going to do it all one time. We're all okay. We'll do it all one time. We'll do it all one time. Okay, next slide, please. Announcements. Okay. Um, I don't, hopefully, you guys can see that. Uh, this was a card we got last week or the week before last, I believe. Um, I think it was sent around also by Joel. Um, one of the mini grants. Well, thank you. Birthdays and anniversaries. Oh, um, while you're coming up, so a little update here on a couple of things. So um, Randy, Mike, do you want to say anything about Randy? Anything you know? Well, all I heard, um, I've been gone. All I heard just uh, before coming to the meeting that he'd spent a couple of days in hospital, possibly a month. Randy Schlentz. Randy Schlentz. So uh, when I get home, I'll hopefully find out a little more. All right. And so, and I'm going to follow up. Somebody has the hat, right? Who was supposed to bring a hat? Norm. So this is what from last week, or maybe TJ brought a big hat. Norm brought a little hat. Okay. Big bills. So I remember last week I mentioned that Carolyn Siegfried had, and, and Chris, her husband had a grandson, Caitlin, their daughter, uh, and uh, he has some medical issues. He's going to stay in the NICU for several weeks. We thought it'd be a good idea if we pass the hat, raise as much as we can. One of us will go out and get either a Grubhub card or Uber Eats card so that um, they, because the Chris and Carolyn are be spending the next seven, eight weeks in Irvine helping out, feeding, food, that sort of thing. So we thought it'd be a good thought on our behalf to get them a card and then they can you know eat out or, or get it delivered things like that so i will ask tj if you don't mind passing your hat around and this is so if for and i believe his name is connor uh the grandson and like i said he was born at 32 and a half weeks and he needs to spend about seven at least seven or eight weeks in the nicu uh, and if anybody wants any more details i can fill you in because my wife who i don't know if you know was a pediatrics intensive care nurse uh told me the procedure and it's um it's not something I can easily explain. All right, thank you. Uh, excuse me, Splend, this is Kathy online. Can we sell some money to participate in that card? Yes, that would be great. Um, we can do whatever, whatever, whatever norm whatever or anybody, anybody wants, wants to do. I mean, we don't have to do it immediately, so we can always do this next week. Uh, okay. So yeah, thank you very much for saying that, Kathy. I appreciate it. Um, you know, it's um, they're, they're obviously going to be there for a while, so. So we'll get it down to it. Thank you, Kathy. Okay. Okay, February birthdays. And if you could just raise your hand, Carol can find you a little e easier to bring whatever she's gonna bring to you. So first, Sheila Faliano, 6th of February. Paul Schmid is the 12th of February. I'm the 17th of February. <laughs> Diane Geyers, the 18th of February. We have Ted Michaels, the 20th of February. He's back there. Linda Tinney, 25 February. And Carol, Carol Lintz, Lintz, also, also Carol, Carol, the 28th of February. So happy birthday, everybody. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you, Rotary. Happy birthday. 
And many more. Okay. Okay, and we've got four anniversaries. Jeff and Lori Youngsma have been married three years. I don't think he's here. Uh, Bill and Jane Nebo have been married 19 years. All right. Vern and Carol Green have been married 36 years. And Yvonne and Dave Hopkins have been married 40 years. So congratulations. All right. So I didn't know we were doing birthdays and anniversaries. I'm going to do a verse of time in the bottle. Perfect. If I could save time in a bottle, the first thing that I like to do is to save every day till eternity passes away just to spend them with you. There you go. Awesome, Stu. Thanks, thanks, Debbie. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, here's a here's another announcement. Um, Granada High School. Any Granada High School grads? Granada High School parents. Parents. Okay, there's some parents here. So they're having a golf tournament, a, a charity uh, uh, on uh, St. Patrick's Day. Hello, uh, Friday, March seventeenth. We will send this around, you know, hopefully be in the spur or Joel send an announcement in case you want to put together a foursome or something like that. And you want to play, that'd be great. Help out Granada. This one, Dennis. Oh. Okay. Uh, so um, Loretta, are you are either here or are you? Or right, I'll make this announcement or are you online? I don't see her. So this is a opportunity. This is an area for uh, uh, service day. If you're interested, it's this Saturday. Um, I think we'll send this around. Um, it's really sponsored by Supervisor Halbert. Uh, Sonoma Glen suffered quite a bit of, of damage uh, at the school there in Sonoma, and so the supervisor has organized a cleanup day. And they're just looking for volunteers. If you want to spend some time, uh, get a little dirty, uh, here's an opportunity. This is so it was sent to all the Rotary clubs in our area, uh, hoping for volunteers. And uh, they're going to provide you with um, breakfast and lunch, a barbecue lunch, apparently. Okay. All right, inner wheel, Ellen. You want to do it from there? Yep, I'm good. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Ellen Bell. I'm president of Inner Wheel this year and next year, um, and. My Adele, Anita, and Wendy are here to help also for our big fundraiser that we do um, every year. Um, I just want to say that Interwheel started in the 1920s, um, and now it's it, it started in Great Britain, and it's now covering five continents. Um, we brought our basket, and some of you, I want to thank you already for having bought tickets, but um, the... The Inner Wheel Club is raising tickets to provide money for prostheses for children. It's only their arms. And I think some of you saw the pictures. Well, they're up there. Um, they're, you know, as kids grow, they need new arms. So it's expensive. And this is what um, Inner Wheel National Foundation does. Um, so I just want to thank you very much uh, again. In, a, in advance, the tickets are six for $10 or $20 for 12. Um, and we will fill out the little steps for you even, um, we've, which we've done for a lot of you already today. Thank you so much for helping us out. And we hope to see you back here as you leave. We'll just go like this in front of the door. Okay. Do you need anybody big, any big bodies, like maybe Roland to block the door? <laughs> okay. All right. So count on Roland to block you from leaving until you've helped out the inner wheel. Thank you very much, Ellen. Thank you. Thank you guys all for everything you do. It's very much appreciated. And and someday I might win. I haven't ever won in 25 years, but oh well. 
Okay. Uh, Bob, are you Bob or Debbie? Which one's going to handle the crab feed announcement? Okay. So it's just a little over four weeks away. Look about crab, crab feed. Good, good. And could you put up the next slide? <clears throat> so we originally advertised tickets at at ninety dollars eighty five if you bought a table, and we even set a table for ten. Turns out we can't sell a table of ten for this place because those are the tables and they only take eight people. And we weren't getting a tremendous response. We got some feedback from non Rotarians that we're a little pricey, so we lowered the price. It's now eighty bucks. If you buy a table of eight, you also get a couple of bottles of wine thrown in. Uh, the key point of this slide is this is our main Rotary fundraiser. Every Rotarian should come to this and every Rotarian should bring a guest. Probably be nice if you even bought a table and fill it up with guests. And we make money, a little money with the crab feed, but we make a lot of money with the auction, both the silent auction and especially the live auction. So bring rich guests. Okay. So next slide. So the live auction items, we have Mike's Carmel apartment for one week in June three, is that what you, June eight. And Sonia, Debbie and Linda are gonna make a gourmet dinner. We're not sure exactly, Debbie's shaking her head, but she's gonna shake it, yes, that later, later tomorrow uh, for 10. Uh, Splend at his place is gonna have a pizza bake he has a pizza oven. He's going to show you how to make pizza and then a wine blast, whatever that is. I think that means drink as much wine as you can. And Stephen Kent is going to provide a gourmet wine tasting, including some special hors d'oeuvres. And there's going to be a condo for the week of December on the Palm Desert. It's on a golf course. Uh, I, I actually happen to know the guy that owns the place and it's really beautiful. Um, <clears throat> there's also a gorgeous condo in Puerto Vallarta. <clears throat> and the last is you'll have the opportunity to buy a bid on a uh, tile in the Quest Center. And that would be to uh, memorialize it on the slide, your commitment to science. Next slide. So volunteers, and I say we'll be back with details because I, we don't have the, the sheet to pass around fully made out, but but Glenn, I guess we are passing it around. Okay, so Glenn has something to say about wait, 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 wait for the wait for the uh we need more cashiers uh this year. We have two shifts from five to seven and seven to nine. We especially need cashiers to help us out with the tsunami wave of drinks in the first shift, but then also the uh, checkout payments for the auction items. That was a little bit of a dog's breakfast last year. And so we'd really like to improve that. So please, please sign up to help us out be a cashier. You're gonna have a heck of a lot of fun. Thank you. So right. not only does every Rotarian need to buy a ticket, bring some rich friends. Really, every Rotarian should volunteer to help in some respect to the crab feed. So, so silent auction items. We need silent auction items. We'd like something $75 or more in value. Diana Geyer is in charge. And Mike Thompson has made the suggestion that when you go out to eat to your favorite restaurant, you hit them up for a dinner for four as a donation to the crab feed. And as a business, that is tax deductible. That's a business expense, not a, not a charitable donation. Uh, we, we would like to have an extra digital projector. If anybody can tell me where I can get an extra digital pro projector for free, let me know. Because we'd like to be showing the auction items and things on two walls so everybody can see it. Hey, what, hey Bob, I have one in my house, but you okay. have to remember to come and get it. Okay. And then be remember, ask your friends to attend. So is there any more from the crab and the crab feed committee's meeting tomorrow at my house at five o'clock? So 
Maybe you want to repeat that, Splin, that there's only. Debbie says that if you want to sit, the price just went up. <laughs> so we only have seven. We have basically 50 seats 50 left, seats right? Left, right? Basically. But it's all we got left. And it's all going to be here in the big um, big room over here, Cresta Blanca room. So hustle it up, guys. Only 50 left. Okay. Great. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Debbie. Hey, uh, remember this weekend on the Friday, I'm sorry, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday is the Violence of Hope uh, performances at the Bankhead. Remember, we had a presentation uh, during the uh, summertime, um, and Kathy, I know, gave me her ticket, so thank you very much, Kathy. I, I'm gonna, Hopefully, uh, uh, it's going to be a great performance. We get to see a lot of great people there. All right, let me go through some bylaws this is again we're not going to vote on this today i just want what i do want to do is um it, this has been sent around uh, i know on by joel by the club secretary but i i did get from joel some comments and questions so what i thought is i'd go through them and, and sorry bear with me i have a head cold and i need to get on a flight this afternoon and i don't think that's going to go well for me uh so a uh, feedback peter well i won't say who i'll just say I don't think it's a good idea that, that that allows a situation. And by the way, let me explain what this, what the Genesis is like I did last week. So we ran into a situation this week, this, this year where uh, the past presidents uh, nominated and we elected uh, uh, directors. And if you know, there's six directors who are elected and four that are appointed. So 10 total. There are six avenues of service, and, and what the bylaws read is that the six elected are supposed to fill one of the avenues of service. Does that make sense? I know all of you just were so familiar with the bylaws. Yeah. Um, so what happened is, and for reasons that are perfectly understandable and reasonable, people could not serve, the elected could not serve in a particular designated avenue of service. So it left me with the situation of, of having to fill a spot and not having a body. So what I did is my workaround was I, I did have people who said, I really want to do that job. Okay, I'll make you co-chair. They weren't elected. They weren't even appointed. They said, I'd like, I'll help, I'll help. So that was the workaround. And I thought, well, does it really matter? And I never understood the rule. Maybe somebody else does understand the rule. why the six elected have to be the six avenues of service. I just figured if, if one of the 10 are willing to do the job, maybe that's the easiest answer. And that was a simple, what we tr I tr we tr tried to write in the bylaws to say, hey, as long as it's one of the 10, fill that avenue of service and to match up people who want to do the job to the job. That was That's the basic premise. Okay, that basic premise. Um, and I don't know if if in other years there were issues when I sat on the board. You know, some people worked really hard and some people didn't work so hard. And 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 I know there's a solution. The solution is like if you can't fill the job, then you need to resign. But I thought that was a very harsh thing to do. Um, my you know my opinion. I'd rather try to find something for them to do than ask them to resign. So here's some things that were. I don't think it's a good idea. This, that allows a situation where the directors of four services leave with only three incoming board members. I suggest that there should be a board member to lead each service, but that any board member can assist in a service other than the one he and she, he, she is leading per prior agreement between the directors, of course. Any board member can also set up their own organization using club members, including other directors to accomplish the tasks for their service. And then another comment is, the four appointments are specific for those roles as I read here. So, so how does this change really work? Another, I misread the sentence to imply that one avenue of service required at least one director. I think we mean each avenue of service should have at least one director. And then another person asked, who are the appointed directors for club trainer and parliamentarian? Um, those are right on the website, by the way. Um, uh, let's see if I had any other comments. So those were it. Um, so next week, I'm gonna de designate time we can have an open discussion, see pros and cons, and see if we if we feel about this. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okie dokie. Uh, hold on, let me check the chat here. See if anybody. Uh, another question is, what did the elected directors do instead? 
uh, if people are elected to do a specific job, I think that's not, not right that they don't won't do that. Um, so I, I know Kathy, I mean, you're asking that probably I should explain to you because I really don't want to. Um, there were very good reasons, and I probably should just explain what happened. But um, but it is you know it uh, anyway. Next one. Okay, so let me tell you about next week's program. We were supposed to have um, the Interact auction. So uh, you may have heard that um, they've had some struggles at Livermore High with uh, resurrecting the Interact Club, but it was resurrected. Okay, so they have a, two presidents and they're going to have an auction. <clears throat> so um, we're not going to have it next. We normally we did it right before Valentine's Day, if you guys recall. Um, so we're going to have a silent auction over two weeks and 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 virtually we're going to put pictures of the baskets and descriptions and things like jackie's been all over this to get them back into you know resurrective so that they are actually active and we can raise money for them but since we already had programs lined up i we couldn't figure out a way to fit them it leaves us a hole um sheila our president elect is working very hard to fill it and i told her don't worry if you don't fill it. Just tell me on the weekend. I'm going. I have an idea. I'll, I'll tell you what it is. <laughs> I'm going to call three of you. I just and we're going to spend seven minutes each talking about our nonprofit, um, what we do to help nonprofits. Just give just just stories. That's all I thought would be good to hear from all of us. What we do, why we do what we do. You, everyone is so involved in so many different things. Thought it'd be nice to hear what you know, what you why you think. What you do outside of Rotary is important for the community. I thought that would be the theme. Does that make sense to you? If you, if you can't feel Sony, okay. That's perfect. Thank All right. You. Okay. Is Did it I miss anybody? Miss anything? All right. Woo -woo. Okay, I'm Italian. This should be good for me. Yes, it should. Definitely. You know what? Before we go there, I just wanted to make mention, President Splen, today we had five lunch orders. So I picked up our lunch. Um, and I just you know, wanted to remind people or ask people, are we, you know, are we done with Ophelia's or it's just a bad week? Do we want to try something else? So I just wanted to throw it out there because normally we've always had 10 or more um, and they deliver and I went ahead and picked them up, which wasn't a problem, but just want to remind everybody if, if we want to do something else, let me know. But, um, you know, they're a great little family to work with. Anyway, let's move right along to our speaker. Okay, today I'm very excited um, to introduce <clears throat> our speaker today. Um, and I, I kind of stole a little bit off of your website there, Cassie, but I thought it was very cute. Finding your true passion in life is a blessing and a gift. Thankfully for Cassie, she found her true passion, the art of making pasta. Kathy is a pasta creator, instructor, mother, and the owner of Cassie's. Today, Cassie will share a little bit about herself and her journey that led her to Cassie's possibility. So would you please help me welcome our speaker, Cassie Wells. You may not be able to see me. I'm a little, yeah. <laughs> I'm a little short. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for having me here, everybody. And I guess I'll start off saying, tell you a little, a little bit what my business is and what I do. I make handmade pasta, fresh, all made by me, <laughs> and I deliver. And I also am at the farmer's market in Livermore. And I do pasta making classes and parties in people's homes. So I come to people's homes, I bring all the equipment, and I show you how to make pasta. So Really, I'll talk a little bit about my background and how I got to here. I always loved to cook. Obviously, I was since I was 10 years old. I cooked all the time. I made dinner. My mom is not a good cook. <laughs> and so she didn't really like to do it. So I just kind of did it. And from the time, I guess, I, I knew I, I right knew away. Right I was away. gonna I, was I had my my, my, my head, head just in my head. head. I'm going, going to culinary, culinary school. school. And, and pasta, pasta wasn't in, in my head, head at all at the time. Right out of high school, I went to culinary school. It was, I learned a whole variety of things, but I was still tr kind of trying to find where I was going to go from there. And I got jobs in restaurants. I ended up going to, because I went to culinary school in Pasadena, 
And then I ended up coming back up to Southern or to Northern California and I got a job at Piotti's restaurant in Danville. And at the time I was just doing, making salads, desserts. I was 20 years old. And so I was just kind of doing that. And, uh, but on the days that it was kind of slow, there was a guy there that was making pasta. So I would kind of hang out and kind of just, you know, pick his brain and ask him questions. And he would show me how the machine worked. The machine was probably almost as tall as me <laughs> on this big table. And he would just kind of, we would just talk about pasta and different, just different techniques and how to make different types of pasta. Well, it turned out he had never had a vacation in all the years he had worked there. And he said, hey, why don't you kind of make pasta while I go on vacation for a week? And I said, oh, that's great. And so I did the pasta. He decided he didn't want to come back. <laughs> so he kind of just never came back. And then it, I showed up to I showed work up one day, one day for my, for my normal shift. Ship. And, and then I was, was like, and I, I kind of, it was, it was thrown, thrown in, in my lap. lap. The, the job, job was basically, basically they were almost, begging at that point they said we don't have any pasta somebody's got to make it you're the only one that even knows how to turn on the machine so I was like okay I'm this is great and they told me at the time too they said you're make your own schedule it's your it's you this is as long as there's pasta we are happy you do whatever you work as long as you want as little so it was rough at first I'm gonna admit I mean it's a restaurant that probably goes through a thousand raviolis a week at least so, so on, on top, top of, of everything, everything else, else, I was, I was making, making like 45, 45 pounds of pasta dough a day. It was, it was a little overwhelming. And, but as I got into it, I just absolutely love it. It's just one of those things where I get into the zone and it's all I want to do. And I can't imagine doing anything else. It was like, this is it for me. This is what I love. And I, I would always get people coming up. I worked alone at this table. It was me, my machine, and my pasta. And I would have people come up and they're like, how do you do this? It's just the same thing every day. But for me, it was just great. It's just, I have three boys also. I have to say that. I have three boys. And I had them all as I, when I was working at Piatti's. And it just was, it fit. But I always kind of was like, I want my own thing. But it was just, it worked it was the schedule worked and it was like, okay, this is great. Well, once COVID hit, every, the restaurant shut down, obviously, like everything, the world shut down for, shut down a, for while. a while. So they, so were, they were kind of, of like, like, okay, okay we're going to stop. stop. We're not going to close for a little bit. You know, everybody just go home, hang out with their families. So I went home. I, I bought a bag of 50 pound bag of flour from Piotti's and went home and just made pasta just for my family. We hung out, we made pasta. And that's kind of how it was for a few months. And then they contacted me and said, we can have you come back, but it's one only one day a week because they were opening up, but it was so like just online orders kind of thing. And I said, I can't really do one day a week. It just doesn't make sense for me with having the three boys and all of that. So they said, okay, we'll call you back when we can get you back full time and our menu's great and all. So I said, sure, okay, let's do that. Well, I didn't hear from them. It was just like, just silence. So I started to get in my head. This is my moment. This is where it's time to just jump fully into it. Everything that was holding me back is now, it's my time. So I started making started pasta, making at, pasta home at home for just, just family, family friends. friends. I, started I started playing around with packaging and stuff like that. So I would take it to people and say, what do you think? Is this easy? Do you, figure, do you think you could do this? Do you think I could sell this kind of thing? Because all my pasta is sold fresh. I make raviolis that I freeze. So those are the only things that is sold frozen. But I do lasagna. I do mac and cheese. I do everything. I do a lot of heat and serve stuff. I do sauces. Everything's just packaged by me and labeled by me and everything. And everyone was like, this is great. It's easy. It's great. It's fast. It's real food. It's go with it. So at that point, I had to decide, okay, I can't make food out of my home anymore. It's not going to work. This is, I need to jump fully in. So I started looking around. Renting kitchens is kind of crazy. And so I fell in, it kind of just, somebody had recommended, hey, why don't you try catering kitchens? See if they'll, you know, give you space or whatever. So, so I, I ended up contacting Cabana Dave's Catering off of Isabel. I think they do on the vine now too. I think they bought them too. And I met with Dave and his wife, Jill, and they are absolutely amazing. He had it in his mind. He never, he had his catering thing. And he said at one point he had 40 employees. It was crazy. And during COVID they had to lay everybody off. 
And he goes, I started seeing that all these startup things were happening for places and people like food trucks, stuff like that. Everyone just started doing other things. And so he goes, I realized I can rent space to people and it'll help them. It'll help me. It's, you know, it's great. So he really helped me get in there, get in and kind of just do hitting people like me, a lot of food trucks and stuff and offers us advice and different things. He's really the reason I got into the farmer's market because he kind of pushed me like, you should do sell there. You need to get into the farmer's market. And I was kind of at first a little, uh, I don't know, a little hesitant to do it, but it's been amazing. And I started at the market maybe in October, just on Sundays. And I was cut, I didn't really know how it was going to go because I knew there was randomly another pasta booth there. And I thought, oh my gosh, people don't like, it's not, you know, vegetables. You're not going to go to different booths of pasta. And, but they kept telling me, they're like, no, you're local. You do it. I make everything by hand. They go, go for it. Just do it. <laughs> so it was, it's been just amazing, honestly. And I slowly, the vision of my pasta dream, I'd say, say has always, always been, been a little slow. That's the ultimate goal for me is a little storefront where I'm kind of just doing my, my own thing, thing making, making pasta, pasta, can teach people, people out of it, it, sell it. It's just, that's the dream for me and more family. It's all about, to me, it's always been, it's not about this big business. I don't want a factory. There is nothing in me that in wants, me that this, wants big, this big, huge, huge like monster, monster of, of a business. business. It's about being local and little and kind of helping out people. And originally, I'm a, I'm a sports mom. I have the three boys. So I know what it's like for families. And that was my original thought is families and, and, you know, eating fresh food. But I found even through the pastas that families weren't really my, aren't really my customer base. I've noticed over time, it's people that enjoy food and real food. That's my customer base. And so it's a learning experience and it's had a ton of ups and downs and I do it all on my own. I'm one woman show. I still am. I advertise, I do it. I deliver, I, I label, I market, I do all of that. I use social media for a long time. That's usually how I kind of got out there and word of mouth. My business is basically word of mouth until the market and I could kind of get in front of people. So, so it's been, it's been so I'm hoping that eventually I will be at that point where I am, you can find me in a little store in Livermore <laughs> and just come and buy pasta. But for now, it's just kind of, you know, I'm, it's, it's getting better and it's great. So, I mean, what can I say? <laughs> I mean, I, does anyone have any questions about what I, <laughs> question? Okay. And you're going to hand out your business cards, right? Yes, I have business cards. Mm -hmm. All right. So yes. first thing, though, um, I know I got I, I got Linda and I got Glenn. Um, you need to, I if to prove you're really a pasta maker, I got to see how strong your grip is. <laughs> not actually, not that strong. Okay, actually, I look yeah. pretty strong. Yeah, yeah. All right, start with Linda. Okay. So um, is there a way that you can do this? I love pasta, but I can't eat it because it's, I just want to eat so much of it. Can you yes. make it, can you teach someone to make it so that it's not so full of calories? There is. <laughs> we, we recorded this one, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So somebody's got to put that question on the web. <laughs> Actually, with fresh pasta, surprisingly, I don't know how many people have had fresh. It's completely, it's not the same as, there is no comparison to boxed or even the pasta you get in the grocery store that says fresh. And to me, it's like lies, all lies. And it just looks like plastic, you know, and it just, and I see it and I go, that's, there's no way they're doing that. Fresh pasta in itself is extremely healthy. It really is. And, 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 Really, I I do kind of go around dietary things for people as well. I have low sodium people. I have all different types. I do gluten. I do gluten free too. I so I have people like because I don't stock stuff. I I work out of a kitchen, so I can leave stuff there. But I don't make so much where I'm every week. I just have a thousand ravioli sitting around in the freezer. I make everything every week. So everything, I get an order, I make the order. I don't make anything ahead of time. It's not like that. The only stuff I make ahead of time is raviolis for the market because I make about 800 raviolis a week for just the market. 
And then I have my own delivery things that I get on, throughout the week. So it's, but it can, it, I think that's a, I, that's a myth I don't like is most people think that pasta is not good for you. Fresh pasta is amazing for you. It's great. It's in, I mean, you can make it without egg. You can make it with egg. I never make it with salt. I don't put salt in any of my pasta dough because I do a, I do a semolina flour, olive oil and egg, and that's it. And some people don't like or some people can't have eggs or whatever. So I'll just do water. I do different, you know, so I feel like you can, it's, it is healthy. You can eat it <laughs> and enjoy it. <laughs> right. It's more like it's what you put in, on it yes. is more yes. caloric. Yes. Than yes. And how much you consume. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So you partially answered my one of my questions, which my wife and I love to make and eat pasta, and we always use 100% semolina, but you know, you read the Italian cookbooks and some say it has to be 100% semolina, some say it's got to be a mixture, some say don't you, you said you use semolina, uh, okay. what's, what's your philosophy so on that? So flour-wise, there is a big thing with flour. I, first of all, stay away from all purpose, completely. So, but with flour, I use a semolina, but I prefer semolina durum, which durum is that more flour texture of like you would look, you'd see all purpose flour, except for it's bright yellow. They, it's just a different grind of the actual semolina. I know like in stores, you can get the Bob's mill or whatever. I don't like that flour. I never use it. it. It's too hard, rough. It's impossible to roll out. Usually the, the finer, almost flour-like flour, the soft stuff will make the best pasta. So the great thing about pasta though too, is even the, the guy that showed me and taught me how to make pasta, my recipe is not his recipe. He, I over time created my own that worked for me and I do a blend. So sometimes when I do for a flour, for a pasta, if I'm making, would say like a rigatoni in a extruded type pasta, I don't use egg in that and it's a water based one. So for those types, I like to do more of a heartier mix. So I'll mix a coarse semolina with a more durum and it'll give you more of a bite. So there is. It, but it is very forgiving with pasta. I, when I do these parties with people and I tell them, okay, here's your, you know, do a third cup of this or whatever, and they do it, everybody looks, looks different and they're always kind of like, like, does mine need more water? Does mine need more? You know, and I always start to just add a little this a little of that. Pasta is very forgiving. You can do, you can fix it, basically. You can fix pasta. It's not like baking, <laughs> which I am awful at. It does not have to. There is a very, when you can cook, you don't usually can cook everything. <laughs> it's, there's always a, like a fine line. <laughs> oh. I ask, are you going to write a book? You just gave us I, uh, wonderful material. Yeah, maybe one day. <laughs> as long as I don't have to, I can do it on a little scratch paper because I'm not a computer person at all. I That's where I get lost. I had my website was made by a friend of mine who I paid in pasta. So she kind of just like, I go, can you help me? Because she had made her own website. And she goes, yeah, sure. I'll be. I still sometimes go on it and I'm looking at it and I go, I don't know how to fix this. Why is it doing this? And so it's, yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, I want to thank you for that uh, uh, fantabulous presentation. <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I say fantabulous because um, uh, that's what it takes, you know, to to get to the next level in life, you know, and I really applaud your story because they called you back and I can see the passion in what you do. And I can guarantee you right now that you're gonna, you're gonna blow the heavens up, you know, definitely Thanks. with your passion, you love it, stick to it, no matter what happens, stick to that yeah. vision because I can see the vision that made you step out of, Guys, I'm talking here, okay? <laughs> so uh, step out of your comfort zone and knowing that that one hour will not feed three children. Yeah. And you stepped out in faith, you know, to do yeah. what you need to do. That is what it takes, you know, to own your own business and become a boss. And you will do that so, yeah. so in, in so many ways. Oh. So I want to thank you for that story. Very, very passionate, very inspiring. And keep it up, please. And you're going to do very, very well. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. <laughs> I had a question. Uh -huh. um, you talked briefly about parties. How do you, you know, what are they about or, you know, so, is there different kinds or how does that work? So my party, I do one-on-one -on -one lessons too. But I do, the parties are more of just a great fun time. I've done kids parties. Surprisingly, kids are amazing at making pasta. I've done work parties. I've done just girls' nights, couples' nights. And usually it's about eight people or under. And I bring everything to their house and I take everything back. So it, you, the only way you could tell I was there is the flour all over your floor. <laughs> and so I do all of the, that, but it's, it's actually been amazing because I have, it's all skill levels. I mean, it's people that don't know how to boil water. It's people that uh, love to cook all together. I do different kind of things depending on skill level too. Some people choose to like, oh, I just want to know how just to make the dough and make like a basic fettuccine. That's it. They just want that. And so we just do that. And then the group, everyone individually makes their own dough and whatever they decide, if they want to do a ravioli, the group, will, everyone will make a ravioli. Or for those people that are really want to step it up, they do tortellini, which is the next level for some people. And which I found my husband cannot do. I have to say he's, he was a chef for years. I met him at the Yachty's originally too. And he was working at Wente as a sous chef and he was a chef for years and years. And one time I was sick and I told him, I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't feel it, but I'm so swamped with stuff. And he goes, oh, don't worry, I can help you. I'll make, I'll make the tortellini, it's okay. And I swear, I don't even know what he created. It's a new shape, I guess. It was like, it was like a bear tried to do some, it was a mess. And I go, you know what, forget it. I'll wait till I feel better. Let's just put it on the side. So. Usually I tell people, I'm like, how good are you? If you if you love to really love it, let's go. <laughs> so we do so that we do kind that of the kind different, of levels, different levels and then and the then whole group the makes, makes a sauce, a sauce together. together. So, so some, some people choose to like, okay, everybody made it, they take it home. And then, you know, some people choose to, let's just have a big party and eat it. So they'll make it, cook it and eat it. It's a couple hours long of a party and it's fast, easy, move on. <laughs> so yeah, but it's great. I mean, the best part I love about it the most is the fact that people are so happy when they make something that that they made and they had no idea they could even do it like they're just shocked that they you know I my last party I had was a woman that was it was a little work get together and she was like I don't I'm telling you I don't even cook at all she goes I don't do anything I don't know how to do anything I can't and she was just amazed and happy and showing off to her husband of look what I made and that's the, to me the best part. And I do love when people take the skill and still do it on the side. It's like I love when people. Do, I've had I had a kid once where he just he was twelve years old. One he wanted just to learn by himself, just to learn. And I talked to his mom like a few months later, and she was like, "He's still making pasta for the family at home." And that stuff to me makes me happy because that's the kind of kid I was too. I would just stand in the kitchen, make dinner, and. My mom would just be like, oh, thank goodness you're making it because I'm not making it. And it, it was great. So, I mean, it, to me, that's the biggest, the joy I get. Out of it. I just, I love it. My kids don't know how to make pasta. I tried to teach them. They make a mess. And it's just not their thing. But for me, it's just amazing. <laughs> thank you. Anybody else? All right, let's give Cassie. Thank you so thank much you. for being with us. And please hand out your card. All right. Um, I can hand out her card here. It's one block in the back. So thank you very much. I, 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 um, I, did, I think Christian proud of explained. I, I, I love having local business people just talk about why, you know, why they do they, what they do. I just think it's nice for us to hear stories like Cassie's, and we wish you the best of course and uh all success and visitor you're uh, on both well it's just now sundays now right yeah all right but visitor visitor on on sunday mornings in downtown on second street and uh we've we've bought stuff from her and uh, uh you were probably pretty scared to deliver that lasagna at my house i would imagine uh driving all the way out there uh, but um, but I, I've gone over there on Sundays and bought stuff from her, and it's really it's really great stuff. And and I know how to make pasta. Um, there's a YouTube channel if you guys are interested called Pasta Grannies. Um, it's hilarious, <laughs> absolutely hilarious. 
uh, and it's a, they ask uh, Italian grandmothers in Italy how to make their their pasta. It's pretty pretty damn. In fact, my kids got me the pasta granny cookbook for Christmas this year. Pretty pretty damn hilarious. Okay, um, we have you know we're we we have plenty of time, or we can just leave. Does anybody have anything they want to talk about, or or should we just leave early? Oh yes, well Roland, Roland is there. Roland's not gonna let you out. Sheila, you got anything? Um, let's see. I do want to make a push. Uh, Kathy will probably appreciate this. The district conference is April 27. Kathy, correct me, please. 26, something like that. 29, something like that. It's 29th. Okay. It's so the 29th. I, uh, April 29th. It has, is at in Mount, it's Mountain View, right? The Computer yes. Science Museum. Right? Yes. So um, I, I bought a dinner ticket for Saturday. I know we're trying to get a table together. Um, if anybody's interested, you know, we, 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 the club will pay for one meal or one event, whatever you want to call it. So if you're interested in going, I've never been to that museum. And actually that was half the reason why I wanted to go because I've never been to that museum. I'd like to see what it's like. So if you're interested, uh, any other announcements? You know, I did have one uh, folks. We're going to have an offsite meeting on May 24th. It'll be at Alden Lane Nursery, and Jackie is going to be our presenter. Um, so I just wanted to give you guys all a heads up. You'll be seeing a lot of it, but at least we've got one so far, Mr. President. I know you wanted me to get a couple more. I'll, I'm working on it. But anyway, May 24th at Alden Lane Nursery, we're going to be meeting there uh, for an off-site meeting. It'll be uh, conducted by Jackie, and she'll maybe get us all whipped up after all this rain what to do. Yes, sir. And no, I I don't think it can be a hybrid meeting. I don't think I, I don't. You know, I I think Dennis was trying to do a joke there because Mark got it, and uh, you did not. I yeah. you know what I'm impressed. That was very good. <laughs> now I got it. <laughs> okay, we got we got Trish back there. I'm a little slow on the. I, I just wanted to add to the violins of hope. Um, I got my arm twisted to be a docent at the display, but starting yesterday and I think going until February 12th, the uh, lobby of the Bankhead has a display with history uh, that is um, open for, for viewing. I don't remember the hours. Like I said, I got my arm twisted, but I figure I'll pass the word along. Looks, it's a very good distance. Yeah, it, it, it's actually an excellent display. So I recommended. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Wasn't this a really good 90 minutes? Yes. Yay.